Hello and welcome to this GCSE chemistry video about the development of the atomic model. In this video, we'll take a look at what models are and why they change. And then we'll focus in on the two most important models for the atom, which are the plum pudding model and the nuclear model. And then we'll explore some subtle refinements that have taken place for the nuclear model as we get closer to our present day model of the atom. Our current model of the atom is called the nuclear model. And in this model, we have a small central nucleus where we find the positive protons and the neutrons, which have got no charge. Together, these subatomic particles make up almost all of the mass of an atom. Orbiting the nucleus is the final subatomic particle, the electron. These electrons have a negative charge and almost no mass, and we find them in specific orbits called energy levels or shells. This video will look at how we arrived at this model and how our understanding of atoms has developed over time. Before looking at the details of why our model of the atom has changed, let's first look at what a model or a theory is. A scientific model is a simplified representation of an idea that helps scientists to understand, to predict and test real world objects or systems. For instance, there is the atomic model, which we're looking at in this video, but also the particle model. New experimental evidence can be uncovered, which can lead to changes in a model where existing theories are built upon and adapted. And in some cases, a new model can replace the old one. Before models are officially changed, they are subjected to a peer review. And this is where experts evaluate the quality, validity and the significance of the evidence that has been put forward. And this all takes time. So adaptations and changes aren't made as soon as things are put forward as an idea. And this is very much a strength of the scientific method, the, the rigorous review of experimental evidence. And the word atom actually comes from the ancient Greek word atomos, which means uncuttable or indivisible. And this reflects the early philosophical idea that an atom was the smallest indivisible particle of matter, which was a concept proposed by a Greek philosopher called Democritus. And this term was later adopted into scientific language and has become the basic unit of a chemical element. John Dalton was an English chemist, and he was a big fan of the ideas of the ancient Greek philosophers from thousands of years before. Like them, he thought that atoms were tiny spheres that could not be divided. He likened them to the balls that were used for a game called billiards, which evolved into pool and snooker today. And in 1803, he put forward his billiard ball model, which effectively just built on the idea of the ancient Greeks. He also proved that the atoms of any given element were identical to each other, but different from atoms of other elements. Unlike the ancient Greeks, who effectively talked and thought about their ideas, his theory and his model was based on extensive reproducible experimentation and observation. However, less than a hundred years after Dalton proposed his model, new evidence about atomic structure was found through experiments, and the electron was discovered. And this new evidence could not be explained using the current model, so a different model was needed. The discovery of the electron by J.J. Thomson at the end of the 19th century led to the plum pudding model. According to this model, atoms were not solid spheres, as had been previously thought, but in fact they had negative electrons embedded in them. And since scientists knew through their experiments that atoms had no overall charge, they knew that there must be an equal amount of positive charge and negative charge. And so the atom was thought to be a ball of positive charge. 
and that way the negative electrons were embedded within them. And it was called the plum pudding model because the negative electrons were like the plums in a pudding and the rest of the atom was a sphere of positive cake which made up the mass of the atom and had those negative electrons embedded in them like fruit in the pudding. In 1909, two scientists named Rutherford and Marsden carried out the alpha particle scattering experiment. In this experiment, a continuous stream of alpha particles were directed at an incredibly thin sheet of gold foil. Rutherford and Marsden used a detector to follow the paths that the alpha particles travelled and they took thousands of different measurements in order to ensure that the conclusions that they made would be valid. Alpha particles can also be referred to as helium nuclei and that's because they are made up of two neutrons and two positive protons and so overall alpha particles have got a positive charge and they have significant mass. If the plum pudding model was correct, most of the alpha particles would go straight through the gold foil or change direction and be deflected by less than four degrees. The results were unexpected. Although most alpha particles did go straight through the gold foil, far more were deflected than expected and by much more than four degrees. Even more surprising, about one out of every 8,000 was deflected by more than 90 degrees and so was effectively deflected back in the same direction as the alpha particle source. And so since the plum pudding model could not explain these observations, a new model was required. The observations of the alpha particle scattering experiment led to a number of conclusions that shaped the new model. First of all, most of the alpha particles passed straight through the gold foil. This led to the conclusion that most of an atom is in fact empty space. And then the fact that some of the alpha particles were deflected led to the conclusion that atoms must have a nucleus at its centre, which is very, very small compared to the rest of the atom, much smaller than I'm showing here in the diagram. We now know that the nucleus is 10,000 times smaller than the atom as a whole. Further conclusions from the alpha particle experiment were that the nucleus must have a positive charge and this explained the deflected path of the alpha particles. Additionally, the nucleus was concluded to be where the mass of an atom was concentrated in its centre in this place that had just been named the nucleus. The alpha particle scattering experiment was carried out in a vacuum, so no particles in the air could interfere with the results and none of the deflections could be thought to be caused by random collisions with air particles. And this was really important because it was the nature of these deflections that was the most interesting thing about the experiment's results. The scientists knew that alpha particles were positively charged and they concluded that the nucleus of atoms must also have a positive charge because this would explain the fact that there is repulsion between these particles since like charges repel. And this was thought to be the reason why so many of the alpha particles followed a curved path. And the curved paths weren't always the same though, and sometimes the alpha particles path curved more than others. And the plum pudding model could definitely not explain these observations, because in that model the positive charge is spread evenly throughout the whole atom. And therefore it was thought that the nucleus must be very very small and be where all of the positive charge is to be found. 
And that way, it followed that the closer an alpha particle passes to a gold nucleus, the stronger the repulsive force will be that it experiences, or we could say the electric field strength will increase. And we can see that from these three different curved paths of these three different alpha particles, A, B and C. A passes closer to the nucleus and feels a stronger repulsive force than the other two. And so it is deflected away from that gold nucleus more and follows a more curved path. The results of the alpha particle experiment led to Ernest Rutherford proposing the nuclear model in 1909. And this was widely accepted because it gave a much better explanation for the evidence of the alpha particle scattering experiment than the plum pudding model could. It's really common in an exam question for you to be asked to compare the plum pudding model to the nuclear model. In that situation, I advise you to give two for one sentences where you'll explain one aspect of one model and link it immediately to that same aspect in the other model where possible. For instance, in the plum pudding model, an atom is a solid sphere, whereas in the nuclear model, the atom is mostly empty space. In the plum pudding model, the atom is a ball of positive charge, whereas in the nuclear model, the positive charge is all in the nucleus. In the plum pudding model, the mass is spread out across the whole of the sphere, whereas in the nuclear model, the mass is concentrated in the nucleus in the centre of the atom. In the plum pudding model, the electrons are embedded throughout that positive sphere, whereas in the nuclear model, the electrons and the nucleus are separate since the electrons are in orbit around the nucleus. Our model for the atom that we use today is the nuclear model as proposed by Ernest Rutherford but it has been tweaked and changed quite significantly since the alpha particle experiment. The first person to adapt the nuclear model proposed by Rutherford was Niels Bohr. His adaptation was necessary since scientists realised that the cloud of negative electrons around the nucleus of an atom would be attracted to the positive nucleus and collapse into it. Niels Bohr proposed that electrons orbit the nucleus, as with Rutherford's model, but the electrons orbit at specific distances from the nucleus, and the places where these electrons could be found were called electron shells. And the shells corresponded to a specific level of energy that an electron could have, which gave rise to an alternative name for electron shells, which is energy levels. And so electrons could be found in this inner energy level if they had a specific amount of energy, or they could be found in an energy level a bit further out if they had a bit more energy. But they couldn't be found between energy levels. Niels Bohr's conclusions were supported by significant evidence. First of all, he supported this theory with calculations, but he also carried out experiments where he made observations that supported these theoretical calculations. You don't need to know the exact details of the experiments that he did, but they were quite similar to the flame tests that we can do in a lab and to flame emission spectroscopy. These energy levels also went on to explain how atoms can absorb electromagnetic radiation because the electrons themselves will move between the different levels of energy when they absorb the energy as electromagnetic waves. Later experiments by Rutherford and other scientists led to the idea that the positive charge of a nucleus could be subdivided into a whole number of smaller particles. And each of these smaller particles has the same amount of positive charge as each other. And this amount of positive charge was the same charge as a nucleus of hydrogen. And these particles were given the name protons. And so now the nuclear model had been refined 
in such a way that the nucleus was not a single entity, but it was small particles called protons. And orbiting that nucleus, there were electrons in specific energy levels. The final subatomic particle to be discovered was the neutron. And this was thanks to the experimental work of James Chadwick in 1932, around 20 years after the idea of the nucleus was accepted. And he concluded from his experiments that neutrons exist within the nucleus. He discovered the existence of neutrons. And this was profoundly important because the discovery of neutrons led to an increased understanding of isotopes. And isotopes are atoms of the same element, which have got the same number of protons. For instance, the most common form of carbon is carbon-12 with six protons, but there also exists carbon-13 and carbon-14, all with six protons. But isotopes have a different number of neutrons. Carbon-12 has six, carbon-13 has seven, and carbon-14 has eight. And so thanks to the experimental work of Chadwick, our model for the atom now had a central nucleus containing two subatomic particles, the protons and the neutrons. And that nucleus was orbited by electrons, which had a negative charge in energy levels or shells, which were a specific distance from the nucleus. In an exam situation, it is not vital that you remember the precise dates when events happened. Rather, you need to know the sequence of events and who it was that made significant contributions and what specifically they did. And so to start, we have the ancient Greeks who proposed the atomos, the indivisible and uncuttable atom, which was formalised by Dalton in around about 1800. And then after that came the discovery of the electron, which led to the plum pudding model just before the 1900s began. After that, about 10 years passed before the alpha particle scattering experiment led to the discovery of the nucleus and the proposal of the nuclear model. And then Bohr proposed his energy levels theory, which meant that the electrons were specific distances from the nucleus. Next came the discovery of the protons. And so the nucleus wasn't one single entity, but made up of smaller subatomic particles. After that came James Chadwick and his discovery of the neutrons, which led to the model of the atom that looks like this. And that is pretty much our current model for the atom. These last models are all actually referred to as the nuclear model, but what's happened to them is that they have been refined since just after the alpha particle experiment to our present day model, which looks like this. You also need to know and be able to justify why the subatomic particles were discovered in the order that they were. First of all, we discovered the electrons first, and this is because the electrons are charged particles and they are also very small small and light. This makes them easy to manipulate and easy to observe their effects. Then we discovered the proton and the proton came next because it is a charged subatomic particle, but it is fixed in its nucleus and therefore quite hard to directly interact with and isolate. And the last subatomic particle to be discovered was the neutron. And this makes sense because like the proton, it is fixed in the nucleus, but it does not have any charge. And so it will not interact with very many things at all. OK, that's the end of this video. Thanks for listening.